I'm Ash. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Vital Enterprises. Um, and when we founded Vital Enterprises about five years ago, it was initially with the goal of uh, bringing augmented reality into healthcare, um, particularly to uh, improve surgical outcomes. Um, but we very quickly identified a kind of much broader need across uh, a lot of industries, including manufacturing, where um, the widening skill gap, increasing complexity, um, and uh, the need for um, people to work at ever, ever higher levels of sophistication and skill um, meant that technologies that can support manual workers um, became really, really important to, to introduce. So these days, we really see our mission as uh, empowering skilled manual workers to perform at ever higher levels of performance, at ever increasing levels of efficiency and accuracy. So that's us. I want to jump into augmented reality and just describe a little bit what exactly it is. So um, you're probably very familiar with it, actually. It's very simply uh, the idea of technologies that can superimpose visual information onto the world that we see. And it's a concept that's been around for decades in uh, science fiction. So think, obviously, Star Wars or um, Minority Report, Iron Man, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, really, it's, uh, it's something you're very familiar with. But to be fair, the reality hasn't always been quite as glamorous as the movies. Uh, uh, but it is a real technology. It's here today. And uh, it's actually being uh, widely adopted. Early adopters are already realizing real significant benefits from the technology. Um, and industries are embracing this from uh, manufacturing and healthcare through construction, energy, oil and gas, uh, you name it. There's, uh, there's a very, very wide adoption happening right now, very rapidly, as people are starting to realize that this is something that, that, uh, that they need to use. Um, so I'll come on to what the drivers of that are in, in just a moment. But uh, first of all, um, I just want to answer a very common question, which is what is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? So here we have what we call the reality spectrum. And over on the left here, we have real reality, which I hope we're all fairly familiar with. Um, and, and over on the far right there is virtual reality, which is where you are kind of completely immersed in an alternative digital world. And between those two extremes sit varying degrees of augmented reality, where we take your digital information and your digital tools and put them into your real world, merging them with your real world. OK, so here I just want to show you a very quick video to bring some of this to life. Um, go through a few things here. So first, hands up. Uh, sorry, heads up work instructions, where um, someone can perform a task using instructions that are right in front of their eyes, voice controlled, so that they can, as you can see, keep their hands on their task and stay in the context of the job that they're doing. Uh, and then using uh, remote assistance uh, through, uh, through uh, virtual presence. So here, um, you've got an expert who is remotely assisting a technician who is performing a task for the first time and using visual guidance, they're able to um, guide them very, very intuitively um, through, through that task. And then I want to show you something very interesting from Renault, um, where they are replacing paper-based processes for quality control checks on engines. And what they're doing is they're, they're building these kind of visual tools that put all of that in front of the worker while they're running these inspections, much more intuitive um, and dramatically reducing error rates. They're now rolling that out um, throughout uh, all of their operations. It's been so successful. OK, so um, going back to what's driving uh, AR adoption in manufacturing, um, to me, there are four key drivers. And I just want to touch on uh, what, the, uh, what the key kind of uh, benefits that AR can bring to each of those drivers is, as I see it. Um, so first, driving continuous improvement. And um, what we can do with hands up, heads up work instructions is we can actually start to increase the efficiency and safety of workers. At the same time, we can start to increase quality by reducing the cognitive load and also bringing in additional tools that can verify that procedures are being carried out correctly. Um, in addition, with the virtual presence that you just saw, uh, an expert, if there's something that uh, goes wrong on the line, um, they can resolve that uh, issue immediately um, and rapidly and get the line back up and running far faster. OK, so on to the second uh, driver here. Um, the need to differentiate products and services in a competitive and increasingly competitive marketplace. Um, and here's a very uh, interesting use of AR by, um, by Ferrari, where they are using augmented reality to kind of provide an immersive marketing experience to uh, in attract customers and uh, engage them uh, much more closely with the product. Um, and then the, uh, the second driver, again, uh, what we're seeing actually is 
This is the biggest area of growth actually for Vital right now. Um, our manufacturing customers are actually using this technology to provide kind of cutting edge um, after, after sales service to their customers. Um, and they're bundling a pair of AR glasses with every product that they ship. And that means that if something happens, something goes wrong, the customer can put the glasses on, immediately have a technical expert remotely present with them to resolve the issue. The customer gets back online faster, they're happier, and it also means that our manufacturer doesn't have to send a, uh, a technician out to the customer site most of the time, which means they save on the cost of that. But also, very importantly, um, they are able to deploy more, efficiency, more efficiently their, um, their expert resources, which are increasingly rare. Um, which actually brings us uh, nicely on to our next point, um, the widening skill gap. So, you know, manufacturing uh, has always been and is increasing to get, increasingly getting more complex. Um, at the same time, you have uh, automation, which is uh, eliminating um, the, uh, the lower skilled work, and you also have uh, the most senior um, and most expert uh, members of the workforce gradually aging out. So that's all combining to create this um, significant gap between the demand for skilled workers and their supply. Um, so augmented reality can impact this as well. First of all, by capturing tacit knowledge from those experts, um, which we can then use and pass on through hands-free uh, hands heads-up instructions um, that are available on the job uh, so that you can train someone in a new task um, much more efficiently. Um, and it also allows people to perform higher skilled work by reducing the cognitive load by providing intuitive, human-centric tools uh, to help you get your job done. OK, so um, now I think with, uh, with, with uh, the focus on data here, what's really interesting for me is, uh, is that the inter industrial Internet of Things, um, which is complementary technology to augmented reality, um, is generating this enormous amount of valuable data from the shop floor. And uh, that data is, uh, needs to be consumed, right? Um, so the, the use of augmented reality to visualize that data um, within the actual work environment is a very kind of natural, human-centric way to con convey um, that information and readily absorb. Um, what's also interesting is th these, the smart glasses are being worn right at the point of work. So they can capture live information about the work that's actually being done. Um, and that creates an opportunity to connect and gather data from what's really the last analog component uh, and, the, and a black box of, of most operations, which is the human worker. Uh, so what we're able to do is gather data about things like where tasks are taking variable amounts of time to complete. Um, we can gather data about where errors occur most frequently. And we can analyze that data to identify production bottlenecks and then to optimize operations throughout the entire plant. Oh, I think I've jumped ahead, uh, but that's fine. So um, I just want to finish up here by um, talking a little bit about some real-world outcomes just to show you that this is already having a genuine impact. Um, so uh, here we have Boeing, who is seeing 25% uh, increase in productivity, that's speed, really, of, uh, of assembly, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in wiring harnesses where they're connecting up miles and miles, literally, um, of, uh, of wiring in every plane that they build. I think it's hundreds of miles. Um, we're working with uh, two aerospace manufacturers who are estimating weeks faster delivery to their customers of every satellite that they build. Um, and then finally, uh, the 34% uh, the, the uh, speed increase, that, uh, as well as a meaningful improvement in quality uh, that, uh, that GE is seeing when they're assembling wind turbines. Okay, so I want to do a quick live tech demo um, against the best advice of everyone in the world ever. So um, what I want to show you very, very quickly, just to give you a bit of a taste of the technology, um, object recognition using computer vision, um, using voice commands so that you can control your instructions, what you're seeing, um, hands-free, step-by-step work instructions, and then uh, using virtual presence to get uh, support from a remote expert. So I'm just going to jump into that now. Okay, can we jump over to the glasses? All right, okay, so what you're seeing right now is you guys. Um, but uh, we are in, so, so you're seeing literally what I'm seeing now. So uh, I am, uh, I'm currently in object recognition mode. It's looking around for 
uh, objects that it recognizes and that we have um, created instructions for. So um, we haven't recognized any of you guys apparently. So I'm going to go over here to my prop. And uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to pop this open. So this is. Do we want to tweak the mic? Is it all right? Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to glance down at my prop here, um, and uh, within a couple of seconds, uh, it should recognize that object. Give it a second. There you go. All right, so, so it's recognized the object, um, and it's recognized that we have some information about it, so it's brought up uh, my setup instructions. Okay, Vital, begin setup. All right, so what we're going to do is go through a very quick process, about two to three steps, um, just to show you a couple of different things that we can do with these glasses. Um, so very, very simple step here. First, turn on the, uh, the power switch. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And then uh, what I can do next, uh, it, it's done. So OK, Vital. Complete step. So it's as simple as that. It's taking me from one step of the process to the next. Now, where I need additional details, such as here, for example, I can go and get that detail. OK, Vital. Show media. Video one. OK, so it's playing me a video here. This was actually captured on the glasses themselves. We talked about like gaining tacit knowledge, capturing tacit knowledge be before, um, and this is really how we do it. So I'm going to go ahead. I saw that pin code. Obviously, we're all about security here. So <laughs> let's get that in there. OK, so that looks good. And OK, vital. Complete step. Now here, um, it's telling us to uh, configure some switches. Um, so I'm just going to uh, pop down OK Vital. Show media. Image one. All right, so, so this is a photograph that we've captured here um, from the glasses. But you know we can, uh, we can work with diagrams, uh, CAD drawings. Um, we can work with any kind of um, media that you need to provide to the worker to support them while they're performing their tasks. So I'm just going to go ahead, freeze that there. And I'm going to use that. Let me zoom out a little. OK. I'm going to use that to configure these channels. So it's right, middle, right, right. Let's do that. And that looks good. Things are happening. OK, vital. Complete step. All right. The OK, vital, by the way, isn't me kind of repeatedly marketing us. It's a trigger command so that the glasses aren't always listening to everything you say. Uh, all right, so, so here uh, we're on the final step here, and, and this, for this I'm going to get the assistance of a uh, remote expert, so OK Vital. Video call. All right, so, so this is our, uh, my colleague Craig, um, who's going to be assisting me with the last uh, part of this task. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, give him a call. There we go. And now over on the right screen there is what Craig is seeing. and. Uh, Still on the left screen here is, is what I'm seeing. Um, so Craig, um, so I, I know that I need to set the, the gain here to about, uh, about uh, 75. I, I'm not sure what I need to set the frequency to. Can you help me out here? All right, so what Craig's done is he's, he's actually paused the video here um, so that he can start to, to draw on it. So this is a very kind of uh, natural way for him to provide guidance, dramatically, dramatically better than um, using a telephone, for example. Um, very, very visual. And we're finding that the, the difference in how quickly uh, and how often you can resolve an issue remotely is uh, it's just uh, a, an order of magnitude faster um, and, and more often. OK, great. So I see that I need to uh, set that to about 650 to 750 megahertz. That's great. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, I think I'm there, Craig. All right. What have we got here? So I think Craig is currently drawing on my view. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead now and just hit continue. Oh, we're not there yet. So Craig has all of these tools so that he can uh, basically uh, send things into my view. But we also have the ability to do things like sending in um, videos, images. Uh, we can record all of this as well, so you can pass this on to, to someone in the future. Um, I'm just going to go ahead now and click Continue, uh, just as Craig directed. And it looks like the cell site's online, Craig. So uh, the antenna's out. I think we're good. 
Thank you very much. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the call now, and it looks like we are done here. Let's just click through. OK, vital. Complete step. And we're done. OK. Thank you very much. A rare, successful uh, yes, live demo. Yes, I can't demo. believe that. Uh, there was no way that was going to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, One for the history books. OK, so I think a lot of people, um, you had that great slide that showed the sort of different levels of reality. And mm -hmm. one of them kind of gave me some, a little bit of, tiny bit of PTSD, the one that looked oh, yeah. kind of like Google Glass. Oh, for sure, yeah. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, this, this thing, I, I'm sure we all remember that it was, it was hugely hyped. Everyone, the, the vision that Google uh, was putting forward was that we were all going to be wearing these things. Right. And I'm kind of curious, sort of, first of all, you know, what went wrong there? And, and why do you think that this, the, the kind of vision that you're putting forward, which is one of using this technology in, you know, professional settings, mm -hmm. makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I thank, thank you, Google, for putting uh, that into everyone's consciousness. But also, you know, it was unfortunate that the way it was presented was um, this is something that everyone is going to be wearing on the streets. I mean, you know, that, that kind of happened in San Francisco for a little while. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, it had obviously a, quite a backlash. I mean, it, it, it's simply not technology that's ready for consumer use. That said, uh, people like ourselves, but not just ourselves, um, immediately recognized that there was a value here in industry, in healthcare, where uh, where people, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. I mean, you're already wearing um, giant goggles and things like that anyway. Um, but it can really provide some, some genuine value. So, yeah. Got it. So, OK, so how are these companies, these companies that you're working with, like, how do they get started? I mean, you know, it seems like uh, they, they, what, what happens? They, they buy a couple of these headsets mm -hmm. and then buy a couple of software licenses for you. I mean, it seems like the kind of thing that, like, I'm not even sure, like, how this, how it would work just starting sure. out. You have to build a whole corpus of knowledge. You have to right. redesign it. I mean, talk, talk through just the adoption process. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, we are a, a software company. That really is our expertise. But um, every company that we've gone into has this kind of question of, um, how do I use this? What, what am I, how do I even get started? So, um, so we actually go in, and we're very, very hands-on. I think you, you've got to identify a real use case where you're going to have a real business ROI. OK, start small. Prove that there is an ROI there, measure absolutely everything. I think that's really important. And what we do is we actually um, basically come in as a full service company. So, so it's not just uh, software and hardware, but we come in and we spend a year with you um, helping to, to, to guide this through to a successful outcome. I think that's really, really crucial. You can't just drop a bleeding edge technology uh, on the desk and, and, and run away. Um, I think working very, very closely with the people who are actually going to be using this as well, the people who are actually on the shop floor um, you know, at, at the edge of the business, that it's incredibly important to get their feedback as well um, and to work with them to get them not only comfortable with it, but also to make sure that you are building this in a way where it's, it is not interfering with the work they're doing. It's not getting in the way. It's not adding another tool that's just like adding extra work. Instead, it's taking away um, cognitive load. It's taking away um, unnecessary work. It's actually guiding and assisting them. Got it. So. Um you know, I saw a bunch of different headsets up there. Mm -hmm. I think I recognized a HoloLens. Um, I mean, what is the, can you just talk through the state of the hardware here? Because I, you guys don't make it, but, but you obviously depend on it. Definitely. And how, you know, sort of where is it today? Like, what, what was the thing that you're using? And like, how much does it cost? And is that thing good enough for mass adoption to happen? Sure. I mean, you know, it's, what is it, five years, six years since, since Google came out with Google Glass? Um, and you saw some of the pictures up there of like the, where the state of the art has been. Um, it is moving incredibly fast. We're not there yet. We're, not, we're certainly not where a consumer would want to wear this because um, it just looks like a pair of sunglasses. Um, a we, pair of really dorky sunglasses. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the snap glasses. Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, yeah, you, absolutely. I've never <laughs> worn a pair. Um, but uh, the, the state of the art really is, is, uh, is, is still not quite even at the point where, uh, where it's good for you to wear like eight, eight hours of a shift, mm -hmm. for example. You know, there's, there's still issues with the weight, the ergonomics, um, but those are rapidly being addressed. The, we, we're now getting to the point, I think there's 30 or so manufacturers, um, if not more, building these glasses now. So despite you know, the, what we, the, the dip that we saw perceived with, with Google Glass, um, the, the pace has only increased. Um, mm. We are very rapidly getting to the point where glasses like, like that one um, are designed specifically for industrial environments. They are robust, they're comfortable, um, and they'll, they'll work for an entire shift. Got it. 
So it, it feels to me like there's kind of a data visualization problem here. I mean, like, I, I'm just sort of curious, you know, this is a totally new medium or, or relatively new medium. Um, you're also dealing with workers um, who are potentially, you know, working with, you know, deadly weapons or heavy machinery or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you make sure you're not, you know, pre you're presenting the right information and you're presenting information that doesn't, like, get in the way of their field of vision. They don't accidentally, like, right. you know, hurt themselves or somebody else because they're, like, you know, doing a video chat or whatever. Sure. Uh, it, it's, it's actually a really, really uh, important challenge. It's, it's something that's, uh, it's kind of an emerging and evolving uh, design art, if you like, or design science. Um, no one has yet figured out the perfect way to present information to you in a way that doesn't get in the way um, and, and only kind of adds to it. And I think, uh, you know, wh what we're getting towards is kind of what I showed on one of the data visualization slides where um, there's really no difference between the way that you observe and consume uh, digital information from how you're normally used to seeing the world around you. So uh, it, is, it is overlaying information in a, in a natural way uh, where everything is in kind of 3D and, uh, and, and a seamless part of the world. I think that's how it's going to work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's something that we have are constantly iterating on is how do we like certainly not endanger the, uh, a worker, but also how do we kind of make sure that, that it's out of the way when, uh, when they don't need it and it's, it's right there when they do is, need is it. Is there kind of like a, a guiding principle? Do you try to keep things out of the bottom, you know, the middle like third or like, yeah. is there some sort of like best practice on this or like? I mean, it's interesting. Uh, even even the periphery, what we found, your, the, the periphery of your vision is, is critically important as well, huh. um, and and that's that's where we you know tend to as human spots kind of uh, dangers, right? And so, um, so just putting things to the side of their vision isn't necessarily the answer. Um, what we what we do is uh, we actually, uh, I, although I didn't demonstrate it, we'll actually float uh, all of your information at a particular point in space so that we give you essentially like a, a virtual desktop. It's huh. as though you're sitting at a desk, except that uh, you know you could be anywhere. Um, so you know that your information is fixed here. Um, you can get on with your work. You can glance at it whenever you need to. Got um, it. Yeah, yeah, there are many approaches. Like I say, this is still something that's evolving. No one's yet figured it all out. Um, so uh, Tesla Motors, you know, it's kind of interesting because this to me feels like a, a part of the automation conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk's car company, you know, famously, you know, had this huge embrace of new technologies, new new automation technologies, and then famously kind of had to walk back that embrace. And I'm curious, like, how do you make sure this stuff actually like helps, and it doesn't and it doesn't create, um, you know, additional bottlenecks, bottlenecks that that, right. that that weren't even there before. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the the Tesla case is, is a very very interesting one. You know, you have robots building robots. Um, and in that case, where does the human worker fit in? I mean, and it turns out that very often they're the ones that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, working on repairing and assembling these robots. But um, the uh, the outcome obviously hasn't been as successful as, as yeah. the, they initially hoped. Um, and I think that uh, yes, automation is, is happening very fast, but it's not eliminating jobs. What it's doing is it's transforming the nature of those jobs. It's it's really the need to, for everyone to perform at a higher level of skill, perform perform things that robots can't do right. yet, right? So, um, you know, I, I think it's really important that the, the technology we build is, rather than replacing humans, it's assisting them. We can take those same technologies. We're starting to incorporate our, uh, artificial intelligence um, so that we can actually understand what the glasses are looking at and provide more active guidance, not just instructions, but actually saying, hey, uh, you may want to double check that, or uh, I see you're doing this task. How about this piece of information? You know, I think those are ways in which you can kind of take all the advantages of AI and automation um, and bring those to the human worker. Got it. Uh, do you think Tesla and other auto companies, are they, are they playing with this technology? Are they using AR? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, definitely. It's, it's, uh, it's incredibly broad. I think we're talking to uh, maybe a half a dozen uh, hmm. automotives right now. Wow. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, we, we did the poll and, and people brought up uh, first responders. Um, you were talking about manufacturing. I'm kind of curious, you know, as this technology gets better, I mean, where, you know, where's it going to go? I mean, uh, you know, medicine, you talked about medicine at the beginning. I mean, what, mm. beyond manufacturing, kind of what's the next uh, area that you think is going to, this, that this might work? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we're, what we're seeing is it gradually moving uh, down from the very, very top of the, the value chain. Like our first customers were satellite manufacturers, like the most complex machines that humans build. Um, and we're seeing that coming down to, through to kind of uh, less discrete, 
less complex manufacturing and, and then getting broader. You know, it's not just manufacturing either, of course. Like, you know, I mentioned like there's, uh, there's oil and gas. We, we have a, a, a customer who's, in, who's doing mining. Um, there's, uh, there's obviously all sorts of opportunities in healthcare with surgeons and nurses and everyone who can uh, take advantage of this. Um, but I think it goes even beyond that. Like th there are opportunities that you mentioned first responders, for example. Um, uh, you know, fire crews can be wearing this um, to, so they can see everything that's going on even if a building is filled with smoke. Yeah. Um, or you can bring this out to, uh, to uh, first responders who are um, able to provide instant care by being augmented with instructions, even though they may not have training for a specific thing, yeah. they're still being guided to provide that. There's, there's many, many opportunities. Huh. Wow. Well, so, so I mean, my takeaway here is that, you know, as much as AR, we see AR, you know, talked about for gaming and all these other things, it really has, like, some, some very interesting, you know, kind of industrial and workplace applications. Um, and, you know, look forward to seeing what, uh, what, what you guys do in the future. Wonderful. Thank you, Ash. Thank you, Max. Appreciate it. Thank you.